Today's guest has been a violent bank robber, a shark fighting marine biologist, a passionate composer, an uptight psychiatrist, a notorious scam artist, a lovelorn detective, a wizard named Oz, and a suicidal architect trapped on a sinking ocean liner. He has encountered aliens and faced 3D piranhas. He has held the office of Republican senator, a general, White House chief of staff, and a vice president who ran the show. All of these as characters, of course, but he brought each of them to life. As a kid, my guest today wanted to be the greatest actor in the world, and it became an obsession. He won an Oscar when he was 29 for The Goodbye Girl. At the time, he was the youngest actor to win, a title he held for 25 years until Adrian Brody snatched it. He's worked with George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Oliver Stone, you name it. He was in American Graffiti. Along the way, he got into some high-profile feuds. Bill Murray threw a glass ashtray at his face. But today, he is not here to talk about his Academy Award or his celebrity feuds, although I do have to ask him a few questions, uh, or his iconic roles in Mr. Holland's opus in Jaws. He was never a Hollywood insider. He's here to sound the alarm, to protect the Constitution, to stir the healthy dissent, to protect the lone voice. He told me right before the podcast that I was the one who outed him in Hollywood when I apologized. I didn't realize that. He said, no, no, no. This is one of the best things that's happened to me. He is a man uh, committed to nothing less than saving America. It has been his mission for the past few decades. And it is the subject of his new book called One Thought Scares Me. He wants us all to ask ourselves, when American fails, what then? Please welcome on today's podcast, Richard Dreyfus. Everything in my life that sucks uh, has progressive in the name. Whatever is progressive, not good, not good. Progressive glasses are good, but sometimes, it, I mean, are you, I don't know if you have progressive glasses, but if you do, are you happy with them? Um, I am happy with these. Uh, these are Rodenstock glasses from Better Spectacles Now. Um, and the they do all this high-tech stuff. Um, Rodenstock, in case you don't know, being offered for the very first time in the U.S., it's a 144-year-old German company known for the great glass and the gold standard of glasses. But they have taken um, artificial intelligence biometric research. They've measured the eye in over 7,000 points, and they've taken the findings from over a million patients and combined it with artificial intelligence and your progressive glasses are seamless no matter where you're looking, which is so great and a completely natural experience and completely different than any other glasses I've ever had. Um, right now, they're 40% uh, better on near distances. And I mean, the, the specs on these things are great and they're affordable from betterspectacles.com slash Beck. Do it right now. Schedule a teleoptical appointment. You don't even have to leave the comfort of your home. They're offering 61% off their progressive eyewear plus free handcrafted Rodenstock frames. This and this frame. I love this frame. Don't mess with your eyes. Go to betterspectacles.com slash Beck. Betterspectacles.com slash Beck. Welcome, Richard. How are you? Hiya. I, I, ju I just want to start with this because you probably haven't seen this well. Usually we slate the show, but we should slate with Steven Spielberg's slate from Jaws. I don't ah. know if you remember that. Well, it was originally named Jews. <laughs> was it? <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've spent just a few minutes backstage a few years ago. I don't even know how long ago. Six, 2016. And we've spent maybe a half an hour uh, today before this. I don't know, but I, I think if we lived next door to each other, we'd be friends. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the idea that we wouldn't be friends 
is such a contemporary nightmare of yeah. a country that it's But not I don't acceptable. mean like friends out of respect. I, I think you, we may disagree and we'll find out on stuff. We may disagree on a few things, but you're rooted in the truth. You're rooted in history. You're not, it's, it's very popular now to just dismiss history or miscast it and not care because you want it to bend your way. Uh, yeah, there are people who now think that opposing views are un-American. They don't know that opposing views are entwined and threaded through mm -hmm. the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and what we show to the world we believe in. You know, there's a very simple thing, and it's these documents tell the world who we are and why or who we, we are. Or who we want to be, who and, we strive to be. And we say, because they are works in progress, All right. It, they tell us who we want to be when we grow up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I and, mean, uh, I've often said, but we, we dismiss the Declaration and, and the Constitution now so much. But I, I, I'll lose my American, you know, ism or my love for America. If you can show me a country whose mission statement is better than those truths that we hold self-evident, that all men are created equal and, you know, endowed by a creator. That is, we're not even close to that. We never have been close to it. There's been times when we get closer and then like with Martin Luther King need to be reminded and we get a little closer again. But I fear that that now is being lost as old dusty words that mean nothing. I certainly think that when we allow our kids to tell us what is valuable and what is nurturing, we're going to the wrong people. What does that mean? It means there's a book called Five Minds for the Future, and it's about the development of the human brain. And basically it says that there are a number of different kinds of brains that we can shoot for, but until you're in the fourth grade, you cannot conceive of abstraction. So you can't understand metaphor, simile, like that. And yet it's, it's our obligation to get that young an audience to fall in love with their country. And so we created glory tales and they're good for the kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. And in the fourth grade, they are armed to the teeth and they know that Nathan Hale is a stand-in for America and that George Washington throwing the thing across the river is a stand-in for America. So that when they start to learn the details, they're already in love. Right. When you hear of educators saying, uh, we're going to hold off on all of that until the university level, then you know not only did those educators last read the Constitution when they were in the third grade mm -hmm. or fourth grade, but no um, university level child can understand the Constitution because they're built to be skeptical and cynical. Right. And that means you can't tell them to love their country. Right. They will give you this. <laughs> right. So you've got to get them in love with the Enlightenment values that the Constitution has. And you've got to get them in love with defending those things. So and they have been gone from the curriculum for 50 years. That's the core problem. That's the problem. We're not even saying, well, if you studied a little bit more, they have no idea no, about they have the Constitution. No 
They have no idea about the Bill of Rights. No. None. And they think that the Republican or Democratic parties are on an equal level with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And that is infantile and suicidal. So you wrote the um, you wrote the book. One thought scares me. And that thought is. We teach our children what we wish them to know. We don't teach them what we don't wish them to know. What does that mean? It means that they've taken it out. They've taken civics out because we don't want you to be a participating citizen. We don't want you to be the child of that revolution. So, but if you look at, um, if you look at what's happening now, it seems like all they're doing in school is training kids to be an activist. Oh, no. No, activism terrifies these people. And I'll tell you who they are, because there was a very real reason for it. Um, I'm a baby boomer, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that there was a generation above me, but not so above that they actually went to World War II. Mm -hmm. And I call them the James Dean generation. Okay. Too, too uh, young to help their dad in World War II and too old to take acid with me. <laughs> okay. My mom was in that generation and it was a screwed up generation going between the two. Yeah, it, there, there was good and bad, mm -hmm. and we were proud of all of it as an exercise in the Bill of Rights, and others hated every minute of it because they thought that they had proven the defeat of participating citizenship. And 1968 was the year when you watched on television the Democratic Convention of 68, mm -hmm. the mayor of Chicago yelling you mm -hmm. on TV, the Chicago cops beating kids who were f wearing funny clothes, and everyone had forgotten all of their drug taking just in time to declare war on us for our drug taking. <laughs> And that happens to be a, an hysterical part of this story. Washington, I was asked here by one of your staff, who was my favorite founder? And I humped. I didn't give him a straight answer. And then I realized when you were showing me through the museum, I have a very real answer for that. And it's George Washington. Because Washington was, as an inarticulate writer, mm -hmm. said the most profound things mm -hmm. about us. And he said, the Constitution must always be central, the factions must always be peripheral. Mm -hmm. And we live in the absolute opposite. absurd opposition to yeah. that. And... We've actually had it removed long enough so that we have no muscle memory of it. So, I mean, we have destroyed our history. And, and may I say, yeah. it happened this way. In 1971 and 2 and 3, those, those um, members of that generation were on school boards. That's the way they first became adults. And they were on school boards. And the first thing they did was to kill civics because they thought civics had caused the Democratic Convention of 68. And within 10 years, civics was gone from every school district in the country. And I mean the whole thing, the knowledge of the birth tale of the country, the opposition to the way they did it in England, to the monarchy. We fired a king for fraud. Wow. Yeah. and the aristocracy. And we said, we will teach you that which you have never been allowed to learn. And that's when they started to come. And we dealt only with the poor. And we said, you learn these values, 
and you become American, there is no limit to what you will achieve. Correct. And that was a, a thing they'd been wanting to hear for 5,000 years. Right. And we have now forgotten it since the 70s. Back to Richard Dreyfus in just a second. Uh, first, let me tell you about your heating bill. Heating bills are 50 to 200 percent higher than they were last winter. Uh, good news is, hey, we're going to get rid of all of the natural gas now as well as oil. Good heavens, what are these people thinking? There is a new heating technology, and it is being used by Eden Pure. It's called the Gen 40 heater. It is helping thousands of people save a lot of money on their heating bills. At Eden Pure, a, uh, an advanced heating engineer team combined an infrared heating system and a convective heating system into one space heater. These two technologies work together to heat a home better than your current furnace or boiler or certainly baseboard heater and other space heaters for sure. By using the two forms of heating technology to heat a room, the Gen 40 heater makes you feel warmer and reduces your heating bills. Um, never be cold again and never look at your heating bill and go, gosh, I... Try this, please. Eden Pure. Right now, you can get an additional $50 off the Gen 40s sale price with my discount code. Just go to EdenPureDeals.com. That's EdenPureDeals.com and enter the discount code of Glen50. Tell me, because you grew, you grew up in a great, crazy family. Your, your <laughs> grandmother, uh, you know, fought on the campaign of Eugene Debs, if I'm not mistaken. Your father was in the Battle of the Bulge. Your mother was a Vietnam protester. Um, My great grand aunt assassinated Tsar Alexander in 1881. Shut up. My grandma, my grand aunt assassinated the Tsar in 1881. She popped the Tsar. <laughs> wow. Wow. So you have some rebellion in you. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> there's a difference, to me, there's a great deal of difference between Martin Luther King did, which he was saying, remember who we're supposed to be and who we're trying to be. And now it is so anti-American. What happened? When did that happen? It happened because of the 60s. But and wait, wait, wait. But if I'm not mistaken, you, your fa I mean, socialism, communism, had to be a, a lot of people around you. But they loved America. We loved America. I loved America. I was born as a red diaper baby. Right. I'm a communist son. <laughs> right. I am a communist child. I was born on the left, and I learned where I differed and where I didn't because these men who had fought in gangs in Brooklyn first and then in the war against Hitler, they knew, all of them, why they were fighting. And when they came back from World War II, they were each given a gift, a gift of the GI Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And that meant a house, a college, a university, it meant uh, uh, the ability to change your life for the better, and it was done because the government recognized that these guys hadn't been kidding. This was a nightmare. My father's uh, unit, the usual, um, the usual turn is 21 days in combat. My father was 69 days mm. behind the German lines. And... The government knew that they were asking this army of citizen soldiers to do the impossible, and they did it. And when they came home, they came home to gratitude and love. And I have never known a generation, never, that so was, was so willing to weep at the national anthem at Yankee Stadium. And I would go at every, every opportunity I had. Yeah. And they would look down at me and my brother 
and I'd be singing the words, and they would cry. And one day, one of the guys, whose name was Tommy Grosso, I was talking to him, and I said, I get it, I get it. Your, your totalitarian psychopath is better than his totalitarian psychopath. <laughs> and he started laughing so hard that it, it, his milk came up through his nose. <laughs> and if you could not find a generation that did not revere America than those guys. Mm -hmm. And then, skipping a few generations, Robert Dole, a war hero, was brought back to the well of the Senate when they were going to re-up the GI Bill of Rights. And Santorum got up and made a lovely speech about Robert Dole, and then he took down the GI Bill of Rights. He did not re-up it. He took it down and humiliated Dole. And I watched this. I couldn't believe that an American political party would do such a disgusting thing. But he had. And that's when I... 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 I changed. I became enormously active. And, and I think I've become active on an issue that is not partisan, that is for everyone, and that has no enemies. To want to revive the study of civics, which means the study of the birth tale of America and the birth tale of putting the Enlightenment values to work in our system, that is not a partisan issue. And when I have been accused of that, I say, I am not a liberal. I am a libo, conservo, rado, middle of the rodo. <laughs> Just like most of you, you just haven't given it any thought lately. Mm -hmm. And that's who I am. This is not to be um, discarded as a partisan issue. Unfortunately, I think we have made, because of the lack of civics, we have made the flag our country. And um, the images... With, and that means nothing. It means nothing. Um, it is what those symbols stand for. And now those symbols are rejected by one half of the country. But we're not talking. We're fighting over that. And we're not talking about but what do they represent. And, and I used to believe that, I mean, I know our unum, e pluribus unum, came from the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, who we want to be, not who we always are, who we want to be and strive to be. Yeah. And then the Bill of Rights. I always thought those were sacred. And we can argue about commas, we can argue about a lot of things. But those rights were sacred, sacred. And there's a system to amend them. You know what I mean? Hey, yeah. Nobody even knows them anymore. That's right. We are violating all of them. And all of the chaos of the world is happening because we no longer even know them. And those who do, uh, do reject them or ignore them. They've been um, the object of an argument for far longer than we know. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes said no to... Congress shall make no law. Mm -hmm. And he, he allowed uh, fi uh, crying fire in a crowded theater, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. And, and John Adams, on his last day in office, passed the Alien and Sedition Act. I can't believe that somebody who was there at the beginning yeah. passed that. <coughs> I mean, and, that's and, crazy. And that craziness was... 
you n- are not allowed to speak against the government. Mm. Period. And this by one of the founders, one of the writers of the damn thing. And when uh, Eugene Debs, my my grandmother was a witness to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Wow. And it was because of what she saw that day, 154 girls who hardly spoke English, jumping, trying to fly out of the 19th story of the Triangle building. If anybody remembers the images from 9-11, very similar. Yeah, except there were bodies. Yeah. And, and let's stop on that for a second. They were so destroyed on 9-11, there was no body. But the no, 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 the, the ones that jumped out, there were a few that jumped to their death out the windows. I don't know if you, if you never saw that. I saw them. From, I saw them jumping up. I didn't know that they were. Yeah, but they didn't. The yeah, thing anyway. was, 154 girls looking at the top on the top of the building like grand fiery goddesses, because their hair mm. and, and the sunlight mm. created that image. They stepped off into nothing. The first betrayal. And they fell at the feet of my 12-year-old grandmother Mm. and 154 bodies. Wow. And she turned around and went to the Socialist Party headquarters and volunteered. Ultimately, she became Eugene Debs' private secretary. Mm. At the beginning, she was just a volunteer and... Uh, she heard Debs give a speech that said that Woodrow Wilson should not be uh, applauded because he had actually run on the platform, I'll keep your children out of war. Mm. And then the first thing he did was get us into it. Oh, yeah. And he was denied his vote and given, I think, a life in prison. And... Um, what's his name? The uh, Harding, who came after him, mm-hmm. Harding of the bad reputation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He freed Eugene Debs, and he gave him back his vote. Yeah. So, as far as I'm concerned, he's the best. <laughs> yeah, Wilson was the worst. I think he is. Yeah, he yeah. was the worst. And we're going through, I think, that time again. I, I remember I first started really. Doing, I realized I, I'm a recovering alcoholic, so. Me too. <laughs> so when I'm 30. 40 years. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, I'm 30 years old and I realize I got to A, stop drinking. And now uh, I'm a dummy. I'm a big fat dummy that doesn't know anything. So I really start to read. And I start to read everybody who really disagrees. I went to the bookstore or the library and I'm like, this guy and this guy in the room would be crazy because they're so different. And then just kind of went in and found the connections. Um, And uh, I remember reading Immanuel Kant and he said, there are many things that I believe that I shall never say, but I shall never say the things I do not believe. And I thought, what kind of place, what must have that been like where, as you say in your book, I had to whisper. You have to whisper your political views. We're here. Yeah. We're here. Yeah, that meant to those people who had been denied vividly any right to learn anything for 5,000 years, they heard this rumor on the wind that there was this place now across the Atlantic and... They didn't move right away. They waited almost 70 years. But when they heard that the ones who had left earlier were now mayors and policemen, Mm -hmm. that's when they had to say, I will risk the lives of my children to get there. Before that, the only ones who went were adventurers and... Correct. And torturers. Correct. And so 
these poor had to risk getting across the Atlantic, which by itself was the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And you had to realize how hungry these people were for the right to learn how to write or read. And when they got here, they were kept basically on their ships until a corrupt politician from Tammany walked up the gangplank and said, my name is Jack O'Halloran and I'm here to make you a Democrat. And if you give me your vote, I'll give you a vote, a job, and a house. And he did. So they all became Democrats until Woodrow Wilson said that was illegal. I think it was Roosevelt who did that, wasn't it? No, no, no. Oh, it okay. was, actually, it was before Wilson, because there's a wonderful book called Plunkett of Tammany Hall. And Plunkett used to have his shoes shined and spout to the newspapers. And he said, if we are not allowed to do this thing, America will fall. And everyone said he was crazy. So they passed this law that said you could no longer nominate the, pa the patronage. Mm -hmm. And then they said, and guess who was the next minority that came? They were the blacks from the South. And Tammany stood there and said, we can't help you. We, we would be normally giving you a house and a job, and it, we can't. They're, it's illegal. And that's why they stuck in Harlem for 80 years and why it bred more racial injustice or racial silence and they never had a, a chance. They never had a shot. So I, I want to make sure I understand. You believe giving everybody a house and a job and everything else um, is good. Well, in that system, uh, yes. Because that system was, you, when you first arrived in America, the first thing you tried to do was to take hold of a crime so the Jews took kosher food, the Italians had the mafia, the Irish had the five points, and each group first grabbed on mm. to being a criminal class. Their kids then went and took a city bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. The Jews took accounting, the Italians took sanitation, and the, co the cops were taken by the Irish. And that's the way it lasted until 1950-ish, when all of a sudden, because of the change of progression, there were black cops in the car with the Irish and the Italian. And of course, they were treated like blacks were treated in those right, days. Right. And, and it got so bad that there was a meeting held in White Plains between all of the sergeants Irish, Italian, Jewish, and black. And they came to a peace. And the peace was, we'll stop calling you nigger if you let us share in your, um, what do they call it? The, I'm losing my train. Um, the payoffs. Each, each of them had a specific kind of cultural payoff. The... The Jews took a solid percentage of any retail because of accounting, and the Irish took numbers, prostitution, like that, and the Italians took their restaurant mm -hmm. stuff. And so there was enmity between these cultures. And then they came to a peace because the black cop would go to his, you know, get his payoff, and his payoff was in drug money, which was 10 times 
what numbers and prostitution. Mm. So while the Italian and Irish cop are counting out their usual $300, the black cop was counting out 1500 And they said, wait a minute, we want in on that. And they got it for the peace, for the knowing I have a backup behind me because mm. they weren't sure. And that's how that happened. That's how drugs made it into the middle class because the New York Police Department let them. And came, it came through the harbor and, and it was dispersed. So that culture opened up racial segregation and the drugs and everything else. So what was interesting about it for me is my family is very political. So my mother was, um, how do I say this? She came up with the phrase, War is unhealthy for boys and girls and other living things. Something yeah. that was a banner of the anti-war movement. And, uh, and women took over the jobs that their husbands left when they went to the draft or the war. And they changed their names from Helen or Billy or mm -hmm. Bobby Sue to to, um, what are they, oh, 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 God, I'm, I, it's amazing how when you get older, you forget <laughs> all the names. Uh, I'm not your age, and I'm, I do that all the time. Oh, my God, yeah. it's awful. It's, yeah. But they became um, the workers, mm -hmm. and they kept the country together. They kept the corporations together. They kept the army together because they made the weapons. The Rosie the Riveters. Rosie the Riveter. Yeah, Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. And then the big lug came home. And she had more conflicting emotions about yeah. that. Because given the gift of a week in bed, hopefully, he then turned to her and said, thanks for keeping my job for me because I'm taking it back now. Right. And she lost more self-esteem at that moment than any other moment in history. She was just summarily dismissed. And she kept sane because of mother's little helper. And that was opium. And that kept her going as long as she needed on the prairie and in the city. And so my, you're telling almost the story of my mother in a way. She was addicted to Valium. Um, and it was because she could not settle in her mind her role. She wasn't a hippie, so she wasn't burning bras, but she wasn't the World War II, you know, pre World War right. II girl either. So what am I? So when she's lying next to her husband, She's actually feeling some of the strangest emotions that any mm. human ever had. She loved him. She worshipped the fact that he got back. And yet she wanted to take a frying pan and smash <laughs> it over his head. Right. And that was Rosie the Riveter. And we gave her, or she took, this mother's little helper which from the prairie on, literally from the days of the immigrant wave, you know, populating the country, these women, knowing they had to face another winter with six children and no husband, got loaded. And they got loaded because they had to. And then in the 50s, they... I, the way I say it in the book was they put a little sparkle in the suburbs. You know, they just had to because they were, they were told to get out. 
but not told to go anywhere. So they sat and did nothing. And and they forgot, by the way, that they were taking Librium Mm -hmm. and all that stuff just in time to be angry at their kids for taking acid and and marijuana. Mm -hmm. So it was a hand down. It was a hand off. And I wrote, I used to write cartoons. And I wrote a cartoon. Comic strips or cartoons? Comic strip. Okay, yeah. I wrote one which was the boy sees the car with his father in it weaving as it comes home. And so when he comes into the kitchen, he starts to kind of try to make him look better. And the father, being a little loaded, pushes him away. And they get into a fight, a comic strip fight, you know, with the the cloud of Mm -hmm. discord. And... They forget why they started this fight, but they're fighting. That generation is fighting, and they're fighting what? Well, he's telling me what to do and how to dress and what to how, how to, and what's valuable. They had to. Just like every other mammal on the planet Earth, they fought in the same way that every antelope fought the older antelopes Mm -hmm. and we weren't smart enough to realize that's what was going on Mm. so we thought it was a nightmare when in fact it was just business as usual right and all the times of tranquility they were rare we think that they weren't but they were rare Discord was, was the norm. And when the fathers fought the sons, they thought they were fighting over drugs. They thought they were, they thought they were fighting over, um, well, the way I like to put it, everyone remembers that James Dean died. No one remembers the plot of Rebel Without a Cause. And the plot of Rebel Without a Cause is the story I'm telling you now. Hmm. It is about no one listens to me. You're, tar- you're, you're tearing me apart. The father, who is now upset and worried about getting a raise, couldn't possibly be the guy with the hidden pictures from the war holding a Bowie knife in his teeth and ears of Japanese people. Hmm. And they couldn't be the same one, but they were. And so they were totally confused when Marlon Brando was asked in The Wild One, what are you rebelling against? His answer was, what have you got? Hmm. And, And no one realized the profundity of all of this. This was real. They didn't know why. But they knew that they had to. They had evolution behind them. Millions of years of evolution was forcing this to be an issue. And that's why, no matter how good the civics was, as taught in public schools, the, the television, which was a new and magic mm-hmm. technology, which, when turned on, hypnotized you. Mm-hmm. And advertising, advertising yeah. was relatively new in the in that form. They, they, um, didn't need a nanny. They were just plunked down in front mm-hmm. of the television, and then the television showed them the Democratic Convention of 1968, which blew civics out the window for everyone. So that in 1972 knowing that they couldn't get rid of it, they moved it from history to social studies up one flight and around the corner. And social studies became this gentle panorama of life in the USA, not bringing these questions to bear on our lives, which is what we did. That's why they call it a revolution. Right. And so if, let me say this, 
and I say this better than I ever do in the book. This was a revolution, and that meant we turned all the virtues and all the values on their head all over the world. They either accepted or rejected. If you're going to run a counter-revolution and take every one of those things out of the curriculum, it deserves the same noise, the same um, yelling and screaming and and uh, marches and parades that the original revolution had. And it didn't. It didn't have anything but silence. They took it out and didn't tell anyone. So we ran right through the 70s and 80s, and it wasn't until close to the turn of the century that anyone bothered to say, Oh, we're not teaching civics anymore. Mm. They still haven't. I have read every book. I have read every book about this subject that is written in English. So let, let's concentrate on that for a second. What, tell me what civics is and, and how to put it in back in to okay. our lives. Civics is the general name for the tools that can make you expert in thinking. They are how to think, not what to think, but how to think. Mm -hmm. And they teach things like clarity of thought, clarity of expression, mm -hmm. and history. And history cannot possibly be one version. Right. There's always at least two. Correct. And I, if I fantasize myself as a high school teacher, I say to my history class, there's always two versions, always. How many kids here in this room have the same politics as their parents? Whatever number the hands mm -hmm. show, I say, for the next semester, you take the opposite view on everything everything, every test, every question. And I'll know if you tank and I will fail you out of this class. So that they've got to be exposed to the opposite view. Yeah. And that is, that's why I started reading opposites and then moved in. Yeah. You, you, you're a paper tiger. You know nothing if you don't know. I mean, my, my, my favorite teachers were the ones who you could never pin down. You'd be like, wait a minute. Halfway through the semester, you'd be like, he's switching sides. <laughs> I think, he, you know, you think he's one way and he goes the other My way. My favorite teacher, and I, 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 I so regret that my being 75 makes it impossible to believe that she's still alive. Hmm. Mrs. Palmer was my history teacher, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Wow. She was a diehard Republican. My mother was a diehard socialist. Mm -hmm. I asked her once, why were you a socialist and not a communist? And she said, better donuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So I carried the water between Mrs. Palmer and my mother, and I literally told my mom what she had said, what Mrs. Palmer had said, and then I would tell Mrs. Palmer what my mom had said, and I carried the water between these two. And she was the best teacher I ever had because she made no bones about her being a Republican, and she taught through that filter and defended it, and you were totally allowed to disagree. And she wanted that's why she did it. Right. And I, my respect for her cannot possibly be illuminated. I, I, I only wish that she was still alive. Yeah. And those teachers change you. Yeah. They change you. When, they, when you are presented with things you've never thought about and you're encouraged, that I, I run from anyone who says, don't read this, don't watch oh, this, please. don't, run, run. 
And how about this? My mom went to a very specific high school in Brooklyn, and she was teacher's pet. And one day, the teacher told her, she said, Jerry, what's your, what's your last name? And she said, Robbins. What was it before it was Robbins? Rabinowitz. And she said, you're a Jew. And she was anti-Jewish. But she was still teacher's pet. She still utterly respected my mom. But she was an anti-Semite in the 30s. Wow. And, you know, in the 30s, that's when the State Department was anti-Semitic and turned yeah. those children away. Yeah. And, and you had to respect the system that allowed the eccentricities of a teacher as long as they didn't try to make you into yeah. them. And they didn't. Yeah. I once called uh, Mrs. Wilcox, who was a teacher of mine in the seventh and eighth grades, and I found her in San Diego, where I now live, and I found her, because we used to make jokes that that San Diego was where Republican history teachers go to retire. <laughs> but I found Mrs. Wilcox, mm. and before she could say anything, I said, Mrs. Wilcox, you won't remember me, but I was a student in your class at Horace Mann Grammar School in Beverly Hills. And I want you to know that everything I have come to love in my life, I learned in your class. And she said, thank you very much, and hung up. <laughs> she went, thank you very much, click. Wow. She was the same person then as she was when I was her student. Wow. In the same way it matters how you vote, it matters how you spend your money. Vote with your wallet. Every chance you can, you need to buy American. And that's really hard because some things will be like, oh, assembled in America, made in America. But like this pen, I doubt any of it was made in America. But maybe one part is, look, we need to start making quality products again. And I mean, start to finish. There's a company out there that I'm so proud to have as an advertiser. It's Grip6. With Grip6, you're getting the true American experience, products that you can count on. Now, their belts, wallets, their wallets are great, their socks. When you buy just, let's say, their socks, you're supporting American ranchers who raise these specially bred sheep that produce the modern wool that is unlike any other, very stretchy. It's, I mean, it's really great. The American manufacturers who wash the wool, process the wool, weave it into socks, and then you just wear them. So it's not just a pair of socks. It's an American experience. Please um, support those companies that are taking such a huge hit and risk by making everything here in America. A great quality uh, company making quality products is Grip6. Go there now. Grip6.com. That's Grip, the number six, dot com, slash back. You said to me before we went on the air that... Um, I outed you, and uh, and I immediately <laughs> responded. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't. You know. Um, uh, and you said no. That was a good thing. That was a good thing. Uh, in, in what way? And um, how, how can we get Hollywood or other people and people on? You know, the other the, side, the other side yeah. as well. To stop with the tribalism. Stop. Both sides. Stop it. Um, and start to be a little more brave to say, yeah, that's who I am. Yeah. Um, I, Did you get pushed back when I said? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm so sorry, Richard. I'm so no, sorry. No, it was great because now... I had a, a, a kind of place in my universe. I, I, I had been a liberal. I had been a communist when I was younger. 
And if you had asked me what communism was, I could not have told you. <laughs> as, as I think is true now. Yeah. We yeah. wouldn't know how to describe it. Um, I, I knew that I was changing, and I knew that I was changing for the better, the clearer, the above, the nicer. I knew that. I could feel it. And I, I, I began to see the phrases that indicated that that writer was a duck, was a, duck, was a, a loser. And I, I found them everywhere, uh, on the left and on the right. And it was easy for me to be anti-right because my whole community was <laughs> anti-right. Anti -right, yeah. But I began to move, really, until I became a celebrity and I joined... Um, common Cause. Do you remember what Common Cause was? Mm -mm. It was an institution that was uh, by John Gardner, who worked for both Republicans and Democrats. And he wanted to create an institution for those people who were neither Republican or Democrat or both and could criticize both. Yes. So I joined that when I became famous, and I went to Washington and immediately said, where are the Republicans? And no, they didn't talk about that. And what had happened was that it had become an adjunct to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Then I joined, I also joined the Constitution Center, and I spent 10 years on the Constitution Center board saying, where is the honest history instead of the safe history? And they were really the right-wing version of Common Cause. And they finally found a way to kick me out. And that's true. I mean, that's what happened. And I realized that I, I had no place there either. In Washington, there was no place for to be what I am now. I am pre-partisan. I worked at CNN, really found no home. I worked at Fox, really found no home. Yeah, I've said to Fox people, you need me. <laughs> you need me because it's sounding like such a, a, a repeat. Everyone is just repeating the same. And what bothers me for real, and this is for real, they're not news organizations. No, I know. If they change the name of MSNBC and uh, Fox to opinion channels, I would have no argument. But to call them news is to mislead the country. It's really interesting, because I, I, I think when I was... When I was at Fox, I made it really clear, I'm an opinion guy. This is my opinion. And, you know, um, there were a couple of times where I said, I'm not a journalist. Journalists need to do their work. I'm a commentator. But that became so white hot um, ratings bonanza and everything else that I think a lot of people in the media who were just used to reading the news, thought, oh, no, excuse me, there's a huge difference between what I do and what a journalist does. And now they've just merged into one, and there is no, there's, I don't think there's such a thing as a journalist anymore. I said to Megyn Kelly that when I watched the 2016 and 2020 presidential debates, I was watching vaudeville. I was not watching a debate that had anything to do with the presidency. So much so that I expected in 2016 that the next one in 2020, they would be wearing red noses <laughs> and funny floppy feet. And, and she basically agreed. Yeah. And it's not reality. It's a game. We are watching. I've never felt in almost everything. I've never felt 
all the world is but a stage as much as right now. It feels like we are, everything is just a play. That's not what's really going on. What's really going on is behind the set. We're being delivered this and arguing about this, and that's not it. It's this stuff that yeah. we know is happening. It's happening back here, and nobody wants to recognize it. How about the fact that we have not waged a legal war mm. since Korea? And I'm giving it to Korea because it mm. was that phone call mm. overnight that forced him into action. Mm -hmm. But... You know, the Congress has been completely left out of its power. and They gave it away. Yeah. They well, gave it away. Lyndon Johnson took it, mm -hmm. and that was the end. Yeah. And I'm sorry. I, I'm a constitutionalist. Yep. And that means if you're going to go and give away your most precious resource, your, your children. children, you've got to convince people. Yes. Who are against this war. Yes. And that doesn't mean, in my opinion, it doesn't mean that the president, because of the way things are today, we could be dead in 12 minutes. It doesn't mean the president doesn't have some leeway to take some action until Congress can get their crap together. But after 30 days, dude, if you don't have that, we're not, we're not there. Right. Pull them back. Right. And when Bill Fulbright had, had floor walked the the War, uh, War Powers Act from Johnson through the Senate because he had been told to do that and he had been told it was true. He, when he walked that through, that's when he realized there had never been a Gulf of Tonkin incident, which he was basing all of it on. And he went to war against Johnson. And that's why the war was papered over with investigation and, and, mm -hmm. and committees and committees mm -hmm. and committees until the president of the United States and the defense secretary were hidden in the Oval Office at 2 o'clock in the morning designing airstrikes. They were so hugely fought. And I felt so sorry for Lyndon Johnson, because I knew Lyndon Johnson wanted to compete with only one man, and that was FDR. Because to him, FDR was the be-all and end-all. Mm -hmm. So he tried to wage a war and fight the war on poverty. And sorry, Lyndon, there's not enough money in the printing press to do that. And when he said that afternoon, I have been your president mm -hmm. for the last five years, I burst into tears. And I had been fighting him in every mm -hmm. Century City, Century Plaza Hotel. Mm -hmm. All of the things that we did to stay out of that war. And, and I heard... Eisenhower's speech. I did not hear it then. I heard it many, The many, military industrial complex. Yeah. That is, if we would just read that speech, we misinterpreted military industrial complex. It is, and it goes into the education complex and the scientific community and that complex. That is the merger between big money, big tech, big science, big war, whatever, all of that working with the government and providing the answers that I don't those think in power you want. can name an institution in America that has not been thoroughly corrupted. I don't think so either. Education, yeah, the courts, mm -hmm. the media. These are all these are all now victims of money, of profit. And when I was and, and Greed and power. I mean, individuals well, who just want money. money. Yeah, yeah. And so I live in San Diego, sorry. And in San Diego, it's, it's a doctor's town. I mean, mm -hmm. yikes, there are more doctors in San Diego. And uh, someone was sick in my family, and we went to a doctor, and I noticed his business card, and it said on his card, concierge medicine. 
And I said to the doctor, do you know what this says? He says, what? I said, it's been a plank of the Republican Party for 85 years. That's all it is. And what they did to achieve it, because it's on the card, pay more, get better service. Now, that means that they took the obligations of a doctor, which are known to everyone, 24-hour availability, hitching up Bess mm. and going in the middle of the night, mm. all the things, and drew a line and said, the rich get all of this that's on top, and the poor get all of this, which is not. And I watched them mistreat my own mother-in-law who spoke no English when she tried to use the bathroom in the doctor's private office. And a nurse in the office literally held her out of the bathroom until my wife, and you don't screw around <laughs> with my wife. I know. I know. Okay. I know. <laughs> she, she eviscerated that nurse. And... And more power to her. We have forgotten the politeness. Yep. We, this is hard to say, but when uh, hotel people get my wife and I in a hotel, they will be rude. The normal thing is to be rude until they find out that the guy is a movie star mm -hmm. and then they become obsequious. And what you learn in school called civics is, among other things, civility, which cannot be learned in any other way. It's not handed down through the bloodline. It is not so. just politeness. It is the oxygen that Republican democracies require or else they'll die. And that's more than politeness. And when you realize we have now been raised without charm school or civics or civility for 50 years. And that means that every person who works in a doctor's office or in retail or anywhere else has the right to mistreat you. I remember, I'm old now, I'm an old Jew, and I remember <laughs> what it was like when you dealt with uh, Macy's. Mm -hmm. They would say, we don't have it, but if you go down the block, mm -hmm. you'll get it at that mm -hmm. store. They're not allowed to say that anymore. They don't say that anymore. If they don't have it... It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And, bus, and how about, let's give immigrants who've just arrived within the last 80 hours a cab, a cab to ride, uh, to, to run. He doesn't know what Madison Avenue is, much less where Central Park is. Right. And that's just nonsense. That's, that's crippling the country. I have lived since my graduation from high school in a spiral of decay. I have only known politics to become worse and live off distraction and denial. Mm. When first there was Willie Horton, then there was the flag uh, amendment, and each presidential election was decided on hot air. That's since I graduated. And no attempt has been made in any other way to teach civility and to teach kindness. And I would say the, it's gasoline on the fire is social media. Oh, yeah. 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 Because there's no payoff in 
teaching what the churches used to teach mm -hmm. and now are, are a joke, mm -hmm. all of them. You said it earlier, every institution yeah. has either been corrupted or betrayed its position. Yeah. Final segment with Richard Drivis here in just a second. Let me tell you about home title lock. If actually I'm not going to, here's a, here are the words of a former guy who was a criminal uh, and uh, turned his life around, but this is how he would steal people's homes. Listen. Nobody thinks that I can take their house and borrow against the house. No, no, I have title insurance for that. No, it's in my name. Or he would have to get some special document. They would call me. You know, nobody's calling you. After I've stolen the title, borrowed against it, or sold the property, or done whatever I've done with it, it's 60 to 90 days to even figure out that they're the victim of this crime. You know, by that point, you start getting foreclosure notices, and you realize you've got four mortgages on your house. Not only that, you don't even own your home anymore. It's not even in your name. The whole world is changing so rapidly. In five years, it'll be completely different than it is now. And this is completely different than it was 10 years ago. Um, you need to keep up on these things to keep your home title safe so you don't lose your house. Go to Home Title Lock. This is all they do. A little prep work now may save you a ton of trouble. Home title fraud growing two and a half times faster than credit card fraud. So I want you to go get a free um, title search. Make sure that you're home hasn't already been stolen by somebody just go to hometitlelock.com use the promo code radio register your address get that no obligation home uh, title reports about a hundred dollar value you get it free hometitlelock.com promo code radio we are so over time can i can i just tell you one thing there are only two performances that have ever stuck with me um that I actually wanted to watch the Oscars because it mattered to me. <laughs> and your performance in The Goodbye Girl, when you are drunk and you, I can play this role, and you start reciting Richard III, thank you for that. It was one of the greatest performances Thank you. Thank you. I, I have to tell you that I'm an actor. I'm walking up Broadway, and a Serbian grandmother walks up to me and says, Thank you. That's the best thing I could possibly get. And that means I, I, I was successful. And... I could talk for years and years about the nobility of acting. And I'm not kidding. That's why it bothered me so much that someone invented this feud thing about me and Robert Shaw because I had so much respect for him. And, and then I was on an Irish talk show not that long ago, and I was introduced to his granddaughter. And I, I lost it. I burst into tears. And then I told her she had never met him. Mm. I told her story after story after story. And then we were on the show. Then the show was on. And uh, the host said, I saw you crying backstage because you were talking to Robert Shaw's granddaughter. What was that all about? And I burst into tears again, and I couldn't explain that he was a, a grand personality. He was a great artist. He was a writer and an actor. And he deserved my devotion. And one day he said, I know, I'll play, I'll play Claudius to your Hamlet if you play the fool to my Lear. And I said, you got it, but not for 10 years. And he said, why? I said, because you'll burn me off the stage, that's why. <laughs> 
And I, that's what we were planning. <laughs> well, why does, when I said that to you, what is it? Because I, I understand the Shaw story, but when I said that about the goodbye girl, why does that impact you? And I'm, I'm asking for a selfish reason because I'm, I'm 60 now and getting to the age where you kind of, you know, you look back at everything and you're like, what was really worth it? So I'm wondering, what, what was that? The honest truth is I bet money against myself when people said I would be nominated for a film called The Apprenticeship of Judy Kravitz. And I knew I wouldn't be, and I made money. And then I was told I was nominated for The Goodbye Girl, and I asked, who else is nominated? And when they said Richard Burton, um, Marcello Mastriani, uh, uh, whoever, whoever, yeah, Woody Allen, and uh, I said, I'm going to win. Because I knew what their stories were and where their, they were perceived in the, by the Academy. And I won a fortune. And the next year, I won a lot of money, really, because I asked, who won Best Actor last year? <laughs> and I was the answer. No one got it. <laughs> That's what the Oscars are. They're a fun night. And that's all. Yeah, the, but the Oscar is, it, it wasn't, that's why I said there's only two performances. One was Peter O'Toole in My Favorite Year. Speech he gave at the very end, that is, oh, I just love it. And it, he, it just comes alive. I'm going to kill you right now. Why? Because when I, my series, which was The Education of Max Bickford, the story of a professor and it was an, an adult story. Every week was an adult story. CBS called on the day and said, we're not picking you up. And I laughed, I joked, because I thought they were kidding. And then they made themselves clear. And I said, Peter O'Toole wants to play second fiddle on every episode of the second year. Wow. And they said, Peter O'Toole. Oh, my gosh. And I went nuts. You know what it means to have Peter O'Toole. I know what that means. And they said, Peter O'Toole. And I just went nuts. And I'm hap happy that the guy who made that decision is out of CBS <laughs> because he's a sexual maniac. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna let you say that. And no comment on that because I no don't names, know. Just say um, hello. <clears throat> one last question. I uh, I've I've done everything I can, um, you know, hoping and praying and uh, doing everything I can that my daughter just did not have the talent to act. Unfortunately, she does. But I do not, I don't want her going there. But I also, my folks supported me in this, and there was no chance of this working. What is the most important thing you've learned that you wish you knew at the beginning of your career? I don't think anything could have been told to me that would have persuaded me away from it. No, no, I'm not saying persuade away. I'm saying if she goes in, which she plans on doing, what is the advice that you would give to anybody going in that you wish you if, would have had? If you want to be a, uh, an actor in America, you can fulfill that up to the gagoons uh, in almost any city in America because they have local... Yeah. And they have regional and they have Shakespeare. But if you want to be a movie star, then you have to go to L.A. or New York. 
And those are rough, rough towns. And we don't live in L.A. because in, 19, in 2004, I retired and went to Oxford for four years mm. to learn this subject of... of um, civility. Civility and civics and the damage being done to my country. Mm. And I gave up something I loved and had loved since I was nine years old only for something else I loved as much, which was saving my country. And I firmly believe that if we don't revive the study of civics, we will be dead before 2050. We'll have the same name. Long before. And it'll be um, a nightmare. So, I had led a blessed life. And I gave it up for a blessed life. And I think, uh, I think that this book is not perfect. But boy, is it Richard. And it, it, it infuriates me that people don't understand what this place means, what an advance on human progress this country is all about, and how quickly we can abandon it without, without a second thought. I once said that you, you, we hold this pearl in our hands, and then we think, eh, who cares, and we toss it away, and it lands at the top of the stairs, and we trip over it, and we fall down through this state of constant decay until we reach Donald Trump and, and the, the cheapening of every great thought and every great move that we gave to humanity. And it just kills me. It, it, it's beyond my ability to comprehend why people who are in a position to burnish our reputation, make it filth, choose to make it filth. I just don't get it. May I say, I don't know of somebody that is as accomplished as you who is as different as you that I've, I, I, I walk away with profound respect. You are a remarkable, remarkable man. Thank you for loving your country so much. Thank you.